Thanks to Fred and Monica and Leslie for their great presentation. And yesterday you all saw a couple of uh, presentations on original research from the ARF. So we had Manuel who was talking about optimizing uh, media on mobile and also Chris Bacon, who's somewhere around here, who is talking about research on mobile as well. So in continuation of that, today we've got Horse Dip, who everyone knows. Hello, stand up horse. <laughs> and uh, as well as Jasper Snyder, who together are going to talk about the importance of context and their research in this space. Please welcome them to the stage. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jasper Snyder. Welcome again to day two of the annual conference. Thank you so much for the introduction, Barb. Um, so Horst and I are going to talk to you this morning about the next phase of, of how advertising works. You can get the deck on the screen, please. Um, so this is a follow-up to the work that we did last year. This is how advertising works 2016. Let's get the deck up, please. Thank you. Perfect. So we're going to talk about maximizing media ROI, cookies versus context. So we all know what a cookie is. What is context? We've heard a lot about context so far at this conference. There can be some more <coughs> this afternoon, I'm sure, as well. Every ad has a context. Could be a good context, could be good for the ad, could be a bad context, could make the ad worse. Every ad has a context, however. So context effects are we're defining as the positive or negative impact of factors surrounding commercial messages. Question is, why study it today? There are a couple of reasons for this. The first reason is that everything we know about context effects has been completely disrupted by this, the changing marketing environment. Platforms are changing, TV's changing, radio's changing, print is changing. There are new platforms coming out seemingly every day. Second thing is everything we know about context has been disrupted by new technology, ad blockers, DVRs, and so on. There are more and more ads now than ever before. One study suggests that the average consumer sees 5,000 ads every week. And the fourth part, and we heard something about this yesterday, when someone was talking about, it was Nick was talking about, this isn't advertising, this is surface design, right? So we're entering in a whole new paradigm here. So the way that consumers experience brands, very, very different. You think about the way that you're experiencing media on the commute, in the bedroom, in the supermarket, it's very different now to the time when we, we learned all the stuff about context effects. So that's the first reason we're looking at this today. The second reason is this, the growth of programmatic. So two thirds of digital display spending this year, that's video and banner, is gonna be programmatic in nature. And obviously that's underpinned by audience targeting. Now there's a good body of research, developing research out there now, quantifying the impact of audience targeting. Bill Harvey talked a little bit about it earlier on today. If you look, for example, at targeting um, category heavy buyers, but people who aren't brand loyal, see a much greater ROAS, return on ad spend, than you do through just demographic targeting. So big advantages there. Also, it can be more efficient. So more efficiency, more, better targeting. However, there is a risk that ad context can often be seen in a programmatic world as less important or sometimes even irrelevant. So why is that a problem? Because of this, there are decades of research showing that context effects can make advertising more effective. For those of you with keen eyes, I confess there aren't as many as in the creative yesterday, but there's a little Easter egg in there for you too. Decades of research show that context makes advertising more effective. So how, how can we use that? Well, the challenge is this. A lot of that research is focused on traditional media. Second, the research which Horst and I have had the pleasure of reading over the last few months is mm -hmm. incredibly complex, deeply theoretical, and very, very academic in nature, which is fine. It's a laudable pursuit, but it's not necessarily as useful for a marketer to read a 20-page um, paper about context effects. The third piece is in amongst all this data on context effects, there's no dollar sign near it. It's all about ad favorability, brand favorability. It's all about upper funnel metrics. No ROI anywhere near it at all. So that was the challenge to the ARF, is how do we come out with learnings for the industry on context effects, which are relevant to today's marketing environment across platforms. Second, which are useful, usable, practical. And third, which allow advertisers to think about context in the same way that they think about other types of media investment strategy, programmatic, audience targeting, for example. 
So how do we meet that challenge? Three ways. We've synthesized the literature that exists on context. We've been given proprietary insights and some exclusive research to the ARF from, um, from the members. Over 25 members are part of this initiative. And third, we're doing some ground truth experiments which will be revealed at audience measurement. So today we're gonna to focus on the first couple. And there are three questions we're looking at today. First of all, what are the different types of context effects and how do they come about? Second, what are the best practices to take advantage of those context effects? And third, what's the ROI of contextually relevant advertising? So the first question, what are the different types of context effects and how do they come about? So this is really our attempt to, to help to simplify and structure some of the learning around context. And we were inspired by the 1961 ARF model to contrive or come out with the ARF context effects model here. And there are basically three pieces. So content is what most people traditionally think of as providing that, that or creating that context effect. The content surrounding the ad has an impact on the ad. We also know that the device, the platform, and the media brand form part of that important, important environment around the ad. And then finally, not to be forgotten, other ads, the number, quality, and nature of ads around your ad have an impact on that ad. And there are two key processes that drive these context effects. And this is the heart or the core of the model, if you will. First of all, attention transfer. The degree to which the consumer, or there's very strong evidence showing that the degree to which the consumer is attentive to the content, the environment in which the ad is served or viewed, has a great effect on the, on the effectiveness of that ad. Second, there's a process called priming, producing, producing halo effects. And this you see manifests itself typically in alignment between the content and the ad environment. So Horst is gonna go through some of the supporting research here and hopefully shine a light on some of the best, on some of the practices that you can use to bring context to life. Thanks, Jesper. And yes, I'm just gonna show you a very, very few of the many, many studies uh, that we looked at, including the very new research that we got from members and sponsors. Um, and we'll show you these studies that lead us to two conclusions. The first one is on the slide that you see here right now. There's strong research evidence that more attention to and more involvement with the content, the platform, maybe the device, like mobile or so, and the media brand is likely to improve ad performance. Now here's one example um, that uh, you may be familiar with. It's, it's work that uh, Nielsen uh, has shared for, for many years, uh, Nielsen IAG, or today Nielsen Brand Effect, and it shows this uh, very, very solid co correlation between program recall and ad recall. And we were lucky to get very, very new data from uh, TV Vision um, that shows a very, very similar relationship, but this time with an actual attention measure. And it confirms that finding that we've just seen before with very, very new data. And by the way, uh, this study from TV Vision is just one example of the uh, research that we got uh, from sponsors and members that we can only mention very, very briefly here, but there's extensive research with methodological description um, please contact them, please talk to them, many of them are here, to get more information. Now, here's another example of that uh, from Left Line, and it was presented yesterday. Here's one of the slides to illustrate another point. The more the content is liked, the more ads a consumer will watch. So you, again, you have this relationship, and again, we believe it's driven by the fact that if you like content more, you pay more attention, you're more involved, and it helps the advertiser. But there are some other factors, for example, time and place. Here's an example, also uh, research uh, that uh, comes from us from uh, MESH, the agency, that shows that consumers react more positively to ads when they are thinking about those products. And those data here are driven by food advertising. And if you look at the peaks, I think it makes a lot of sense that people react more favorably at the time when they're hungry, thinking about uh, food preparations, and so on. So in a nutshell, just a couple of examples of many, many studies that show attention to content helps the advertiser. Now here's our second conclusion. I think here get, now it gets really interesting because many, many studies show that priming 
the uh, media user generates halo effects that can improve air performance. And the research suggests to us that in many, many cases, if not in most cases, one of the best ways to achieve this alignment is to have congruence between content and the ad, and that creates an additional impact for the advertiser. And we saw that in some of the data presented yesterday. I think it's also the reason behind the uh, research we just saw from uh, Bill Harvey and Pat Pellegrini. And I think it's, it's an area where advertisers today can really benefit the most because I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Now, we are doing it, the advertisers are doing it very successfully and very frequently in one particular genre, namely sports advertising, sports sponsorship. And they have enormous uh, impact, they have enormous success with that and pay high advertising rates because they know it works. We see this all the time, but we think there are other opportunities for ad alignment. For example, in, a new me in the new media, we see it working very, very well for native advertising that can provide a really good fit between content and ad and achieve superior impact. And you could actually say, I think, that the essence of native advertising is to find this kind of alignment. But we see this in all media. We, we show you a lot of examples here from, uh, with video advertising. But you see it in all media. See, you see it in radio. You see it in print, where this kind of alignment can really have a positive impact. And you saw it half an hour ago uh, as, uh, as Bill uh, Harvey presented uh, these data from their uh, new research that again shows that emotional congruence between content and ads lifts return on ad spending. And I think this is so, so um, particularly interesting and important for us to focus on because the big question here is how do I achieve this emotional alignment? How do we do this? What is the best way and the most successful way to do this? Now we're gonna continue this research and, and uh, we're hoping to be back here with new insights um, in, uh, at the AM conference uh, in, in June. But I think we already have enough data and, and read so many studies that show different kinds of this kind of alignment, ranging from the very obvious one, namely uh, happy and happy, a funny ad in a sitcom. That kind of very obvious connection can be very, very successful. We also see it, for example, food ads in a food show, all of those kind of things. We see it in product placement. But they are more sophisticated, more indirect, and I think much more interesting uh, ways to achieve this alignment that also can help the advertiser stand out. And here's an example. We want to show you an exa example here from, uh, from the Oscars. In seven seconds, it will be precisely Now, you may remember the ad if you saw the Oscars. Obviously, this is not an ad for watches in a show about watches. This is an ad for Rolex that ran during the Oscars. And on one level, it connects with the viewer's love of the movies, but even more so, it connects with the viewer's appreciation of style, which is evident in the popularity of the red carpet. Just about now. So here it is, a connection with the emotions of the viewers of, of the Oscars on this particular kind of level. Now speaking of style, what happens if an advertiser puts an ad a car ad, an ad for a car that celebrates the car's style and elegance into a show that is also about fashion and style. Well, that's what this research shows you from Bravo. They call it neocontextual matching. And I think that's the term for this kind of um, connection that we're talking about here, for this kind of emotional connection that really explores what are the drivers that connect the uh, audience with this particular program and how we can connect with that. 
to really provide an in, to experience to the, um, to the viewer and to the user of, of the media that does not interrupt because it goes back to everything we talked about yesterday. Manuel talked about the growth of uh, ad blocking. Um, MasterCard talked about the importance of experiences. Well, we can't all introduce uh, our customers to uh, Robbie Williams or Beyonce, but what we can do is make sure that when they watch a TV show, when they're on their mobile, when they read a magazine, when they listen to the radio, that our ad does not interrupt. Now, we talked a lot about emotion, but here's one other aspect to consider, um, and that is news. And that is the cognitive orientation that people have when they watch or see or read news. The, uh, this particular research points in this direction, that in this particular situation, you're in a, your mind is in a cognitive frame of mind, and that actually can help the advertiser um, in the sense that you're more ready to make a decision and to absorb the content. So we think alignment here can be news with a more informative ad, and that's something we need to explore further. Now, speaking of ads, there's one more thing we have to talk about, and that is you as the advertisers, you are not alone. As Jasper said earlier, every ad has, an co has a context, and very often your context is an other ad. And very often there are too many of them, and we have this incredible evidence that clutter is a bad thing. We don't even have to show you that. But we also have evidence that the ad next to your message can affect the impact of your message. Now, that can be a positive thing. For example, if you're in a pod, every ad is high quality, every advertiser is a leading brand. That could be a good thing. But your neighbor can also be a bad neighbor. And there's some research uh, that we got from Forethought, uh, brand new data collected uh, during the uh, uh, campaign that shows that the ad before your ad can have a negative impact. And in this case, what their methods documented was that the campaign ads, and you're not surprised to hear this, that the campaign ads erased anxiety. And that anxiety was not a great halo effect for the following ad. Uh, they're in the room, I see them here, so they're happy to tell you more about this. And they've given us more research that we think we're going to share at AM, deeper insight on this topic. So it says here, time's up, but let's ignore that and give, hand it over to Jeff for the <laughs> summary. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Horst. So just to summarize very quickly, so targeting, reaching the right target is obviously super important, but there's a very, very strong body of research um, suggesting there are huge opportunities in, in, in context effects. So we think it's uh, ignoring that is risky. So our guidance to the industry here is explore making, work, making context work for your brand and for your ad. So what are those best practices, just to summarize here? First of all, attention. Medium platforms that your target consumes intensively or engages with are likely to produce more impact. So that's, that's not just high rate stuff, it's also niche shows which have devoted fan bases. Second, pri create those priming and halo effects, either through placing ads in environments where there's that linkage or through, or and or, through creating, creating specific pieces of creative that match with that environment. Third, you're not alone. Other ads have an impact on your ad too. And I think that gives a, the, the first, in, certainly in terms of sequential advertising like TV and radio, for example, that gives that first pod position potentially something of a premium. So we set out this at the, at, the, at, the, at the outset here with three questions, the third of which is, what is the ROI of contextually relevant advertising? Um, you've seen some data already this morning on that. We're going to be unveiling the results of our ground truth experiments on this very question at the audience measurement conference in June. So we'd love to have you involved there. Thank you so much.